Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's Eden webinar. Um, delighted to see you coming in. Um, so we have a great webinar today about assessment of STEM transversal skills from conceptual framework to real world problems. So really looking forward to this today. So if you'd like to just say hello in the chat, maybe where you're from and what the weather is like, uh, that would be great. I can report that the weather in Dublin is cold and grey, but thankfully not raining. Um, so I'm Orna Farrell. I'm one of. And just before I hand over it to my colleague, uh, Lily, I'd just like to give you a little introduction to Eden Knapp. Maybe haven't heard of what the NAP is. I'm going to just tell you because we that, that comes up a fair bit. So the Eden uh, NAP is the network of academics and professionals. And we run webinars like this every month, usually on the first Wednesday of the month. Um, and our aim is knowledge sharing, networking, uh, collaboration. Uh, and most people are interested in the areas of online distance, open education, quite a diverse group of educators from many sectors uh, and many levels and a lot of people inv involved in learning technology as well. So this, uh, the, here's the Eden website. If you'd like to learn more about the organization, uh, you can find out there. And here is the current, current Eden app steering committee. Um, so welcome today from, from the whole steering committee. And now I'll hand over to my colleague, Lily, to introduce the speakers. Hi, everyone. Great to see you today. Um, we have a very exciting lineup of speakers today. Um, our first speaker, I'll just go ahead and introduce him, is Dr. Eamon Costello. Eamon Costello is Associate Professor at Dublin City University, and he's also the lead PI and coordinator on the ATS STEM project. Um, he, he's an expert in digital learning, post-digital social science fiction. And when he's not busy with research, he likes hiking, running, and science fiction. So I'll hand it over to you, Eamon. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Lily. I'll just see, can I grapple with technology now and share my um, screen? Wait one second. So let's get going here. So, as Orna mentioned, we're going to talk a bit about um, STEM from transversal skills to frameworks. I've got a glitching, slightly glitching screen there that will correct itself in a second, hopefully. Um, but uh, I don't know why it does that, but let's see. Okay. So the, the overall theme is we're going to talk about conceptual frameworks for teaching transversal skills and those frameworks to real world problems. And within that, I'm going to give you an overview about some of those, unpack some of those elements about what real world problems we might be, what STEM is and transversal skills, and some of my impressions from what's a very huge project involving a, a, a huge number of people, a great community. Um, and the title of my talk is, Who is STEM and what could they teach us? So it's a little bit clunky. And my name is Eamon Costello, as Lily says, I, I work in DCU in Dublin City University. It's it's an honor to be able to talk to the Eden Research Network, the Eden Network today. I've been involved in Eden for a long number of years and it's a, a wonderful community. Um, so I work in DCU, that's my family and the DCU sign. Um, in happier times in 2018, Mother's Day. I work in this building here, the B Orphan Building, it's got a brown, ugly exterior, but inside it, it's very warm and lovely because I work with a great team of people. And it's named after this lady here, and she's a painter. She's a famous Irish painter, and it's one of the few, one of the most, the earliest buildings in the university that was named after a woman. There was very few buildings named after, after women in the university. Um, and I see her paintings as I go up the stairs to my office. They're hanging on the wall of the building. Um, so it's quite interesting because as, as somebody once said, we shape our dwellings and afterwards they shape us. So this idea of, of, of form of function is interesting. And the building, this woman is a painter. And there's a link as well between STEM and painting because there's a 
big initiative in Dublin City University, the Women on Walls Initiative. And we have a sequ- we commissioned a sequence with, with Accenture, a, a, a series of artists to do portraits of famous people in STEM. This is Marie Maynard Daly being painted here. She was the first African-American woman to earn a PhD in chemistry. And there's a sequence of these women here that have been painted by these painters. <clears throat> and the, the paintings are hanging on, on buildings in, in, in our university. And it's it's a very interesting and indeed moving initiative because the creativity and the intelligence and the passion of the scientists, these scientists, is these female scientists is matched for me by the 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 ability of the painters, which is absolutely wonderful. So and it was kind of interesting which type of knowledge we we value. However, it was maybe fitting for a woman to have a a building named after being a painter, but now it's it's um, in the past. But now we're we're we're, we're recognising women for STEM, and, and this is one of the women, and we've named a building after her. She's Kathleen Lonsdale. She's a famous scientist. She worked um, on uh, crystallography and it made some key inve- investigations in X-ray technology. And our School of Biotechnology and Chemical Sciences in Dublin City University is named after her. She has made some um, critical uh, advances in this field, but she also uh, was a committed pacifist. And during World War II, she spent a month in jail after refusing to register for civil defense. And she later campaigned for more ethical treatment of of women in prison. And she wrote a book about that, which is very interesting. And it's kind of interesting because we have this idea of STEM and real world skills and scientists but there are also these people with, with private lives and who are making impacts in other dimensions. STEM is not STEM is not apolitical. And this slide here, I just you can uh, type in the chat if you have any ideas on this one. London has more statues of animals than of named women and audit mines. So there's an interesting statue of, of a lion there. And there's actually a problem with this um, with this title here. You're going to see the chat. I'm not sure I can. But maybe you could see if you if you can understand what this title is and why there might be an error in the title and maybe something about this image as well that might be interesting to you. And I'll, I'll have a look at the chat later as I, as I get through my slides. Um, so this project on, on STEM skills is being conducted by a big consortium across Europe from Cyprus in the south way up to Finland in the top. And we're going to hear stories from some of these countries um, during this webinar session. Um, And one of the things we were doing was developing a conceptual framework. It's a research project that engaged with teachers and learners in schools across several European countries in helping them to develop transversal skills and to help teachers with formative digital assessment of STEM learners work as they develop real world authentic STEM skills. And we have these four components, STEM competencies, digital assessment tools, learning design principles, and formative assessment tasks, which is probably the key one, the the orange one at the bottom, this idea of giving um, teachers tools to better plan lessons and and share learning intentions and clarify those and assess those using technology, and particularly with this idea of STEM skills and integrated STEM skills. So you're you're using more than one discipline. So we have a lot going on in this framework. We had over uh, 20 components. Each one of these four uh, leaves that stems out from the integrated STEM learning outcomes develops further. So STEM learning design principles um, develops into these one, two, three, four, five, six sub ones. And uh, one of these is uh, real world contexts and how do we assess authentic STEM skills? So that's one of the big things from the literature we found. We published uh, a number of interesting reports on this uh, research reports on all these on these topics, um, and this framework had to be evolvable because we were going through a, a pandemic. Um, so we were we were adapting, and, and teachers showed huge creativity and adaptability. And this is an example of some of the cards, the learning design cards toolkit that we developed. These are both digital, a wonderful course by our colleagues in, in Tampere, uh, in Helsinki, uh, in Tampere, rather, in Finland. And these are some cards from our colleagues in um, Ireland, some of our Irish partners that they use in schools. 
And here's an example of one. So they they scaffold teachers to develop um, integrated STEM learning designs, lesson plans for their classes and use use digital tools to assess those lessons and plan them. And they have cards to walk them through and they use the UN Sustainability Goals, for example. And here's a nice one from uh, Slovenia. Um, they're using they're using a, a project in their local environment, a stream and the beavers in the stream, and they're defining a real world problem related to a sustainable development goal. And they're going through steps with, with students to find the, the solutions to, to this problem. Here's an example from, from Ireland using these cards to plan a class, taking this a, a step further from identifying the problem and planning out how they're, what tools they're gonna to use, how they're gonna send and display information, share success criteria, learning outcome with students, see if those uh, understandings have been met about what the learning outcomes are, and then giving feedback based on that and, and self and peer assessment. And basically giving tools to teachers to help them plan and be organized and give clarity to students, which is vitally important. And this is a lovely uh, image from Cyprus. Some of our students uh, there in one of the, our pilot schools, and they were designing their school yard. Um, and it was really nice because you talk about real world problems and having authentic assessment and real world impact. They wrote a letter to their, their governing board of their school as well to get permission to change the yard, and they did lots of designs for it. And this was one of the common features of a lot of our, our projects was outdoor education and learning. A teaser for some wonderful work that went on in Sweden as well in a much, much colder climate at the uh, much north, more northerly part of Europe. There's some students engaged in some great work. And in Ireland, our, our, one of our teachers in, in one school did some wonderful work with students on an integrated STEM topic using different aspects of STEM, bringing them together. And they looked at trees. They designed a sensory garden using native plants um, in their, uh, and they, they developed drawings for this and plans. And they used Blooklet and Mentimeter uh, and Kahoot as the digital tools to assess their students on this. Um, and these book creators as well, actually. And we assessed all of this with a big comprehensive research methodology. And my colleague, um, Colette Kerwin, led out on the research in this, and we published a, a report on this. In addition to these research reports were being published all over um, the partner countries. And in the Irish contract context, to give you a flavor of, of some of the things we found in this research, um, uh, the workshops by teacher mentors were crucial to understanding the framework and its application. So we did a lot of work with uh, teaching mentors about STEM skills and they went on and taught teachers and they went on and taught students. So it's a big complex pyramid. Uh, networking events with teachers from partner countries were invaluable for connecting learners with each other um, and realizing solutions that had wider impact and showing teachers that they're part of Europe and there's such a big picture and and the work that's going on is so wonderful and it was really heartening and important in a pandemic i think for for us to be able to work with teachers and for teachers to be able to see what they were doing in the different countries and have a real pride in what they were doing in their work as well which was very evident it was a diverse picture of technology levels across classrooms of course any uh project with digital technology is very fraught because there's no single standard there's no single tool there's access issues there's all these these things uh so we were trying to select tools that are multifunctional for that reason that was one of the findings then that consider both teachers and the students perspectives and they can reduce training so you've got to have a tool that's adapted to the environment and that's useful um and at the policy level, there's a need for structured support, scaffolding and digital assessment practices across Ireland, uh, as an example, and awareness and consideration of these challenges is, is key. Um, so I, I highlighted some of these problems about digital complexity, device access, et cetera. Platformization is a big one. We're, we're, being, we're very reliant on some key tools now in, in schools across Europe. Collaboration versus cooperation. I'll talk a bit about that. I, I won't talk too much more about this because I have a few more slides. 
But I think Alberto might might touch on some of this in his talk. He he did some wonderful work with students on on collaboration, and it's an interesting thing when you're when you're evaluating individual skills and you're trying to trade that off against group outcomes. And one of the big pluses across all of the countries where we did this research, I think for me, one of the, the takeaways for me was the increase in teacher feedback literacy and its interplay with student feedback literacy. And this idea of just really in-depth work on feedback literacy and what that looks like, sharing learning intentions with and outcomes with students, clarifying those, assessing those, reflecting on that, using tools to do that. And um, this was huge. And, and making students, uh, using peer assessment with students and what that looks like and the complexity of that, the difficulties of that. And at the start of my talk, I said, who is STEM and what can they teach us? So it could be, it could be, um, it could be a male, it could be a lion, it could be an animal, a, a non-human animal. Uh, it could be a woman, it could be a teacher. STEM is, teaching is a very gendered profession. What could they teach us? Well, the students can teach us. And this is a lovely quote from one of the students in Ireland. They're teaching one of their teachers about, about trees. And I'll just let you read that for a minute, if you like. And basically, there was just telling them about a, a tree in, in their native environment that the teacher did not know about, but one of the kids knew a lot about trees. And the good news is that a lot of research is coming out following the pandemic. And you know what? Parents really like teachers because they know teaching is really, really hard because they've been doing it at home. They trust teachers and they think it's intellectually demanding work. And the point of education is not that students learn, this is a Gert Bestia quote, but that it's that they learn something. They learn it for a reason and they learn from so someone and this, this quote is interesting in this sentence because it foregrounds teaching as a real and authentic activity. So we talk a lot in STEM about STEM industries and real world problems and all this kind of stuff. Teaching and learning are inherently good, nurturing and vitally important real world activities. It's not some real world of industry out there. It's, it's, it's very real. So that is the end of my presentation and thank you very much. Thanks, Eamon. That was really interesting. And I also love the quote at the end, actually. But let's move on to our second keynote speaker, Dr. Eva Hartel. Dr. Eva Hartel is currently head of research in Hanningham Municipality and researcher at KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden. Eva is also involved in a number of national and international practitioner-based research and development projects, and she works closely with teachers and schools. When not busy with research, Eva enjoys horseback riding, cross-country skiing, and baking. So let's hear from Eva. Thank you, Lily. I'll just share my screen. So thank you, Lily. <laughs> thank you for the introduction. I really don't like to introduce myself, so you helped me there. And first of all, thank you for inviting me to this Eden Network uh, event. Uh, I can admit that I never heard about Eden Network event, but I can assure you that I will be back because it seems like a fascinating network and uh, with really interesting webinars and other things that I would I enjoy. And I will give you, uh, I will present some of the work that we have done in Honningen together with teachers. And I am the presenter now, but we, we are a team that has done this, have done this together. And um, I will give you a brief overview and then we can talk about the things in other, uh, we, we will find other opportunities to go more into depth. So the context of the study, well, it, it's in Honningen municipality. It's in, a, in about 20 minutes uh, by car from Stockholm city. And we are a, 
a huge, well, sort of huge municipality. We have 90,000 inhabitants and we have small islands and we have high rise buildings. So it's a diverse municipality. And we have together in this project, we have worked with 13 teachers and seven in seven schools. We have 17 schools, but we have worked with seven. And our municipality are very fortunate because we have a multilingual school environment. We have students from all across the world. And we, so there are many cultures and many languages spoken in our, language, in, in our schools. And we have seized the opportunity here to embrace uh, uh, as much as we can all the different um, experiences that is in our schools. And uh, we have um, one thing, well, a lot of things we have done, but one thing uh, that has came out of this project, this ATS STEM project that we have been fortunate to be involved in, is that we have uh, learned a lot more about the, um, how to work with the, the ethical considerations that you do when you work with together with schools and especially when you conduct research. Uh, and that's a seeking informed consent. And seeking informed consent is something that you do as a researcher that comes with a, with, with a job, so to speak. But doing so in a multilingual school environment is um, something that we have from this project learned more about because we have involved our uh, special educational teachers who is specialized in teaching and learning in second language, uh, Swedish as a second language. And she uh, made us more aware of the importance of actually communicating the informed in the emphasizing the informed in informed consent. Because if you don't have Swedish as your first language, then it might be a bit more problematic to, to actually get in for us to inform the informed consent. So we, have, we used the template for the informed consent and we translated it to different languages. In our municipality, we have at, at least 45 different languages that is spoken in our schools by the, the, the pupils and also by, by their guardians. And we support them in terms of language. In, we support them and we teach them their, their mother tongue, but also we support them in different um, in different sub school subjects as well in their own mother tongue to, to enhance their Swedish language, but also to enhance their mother tongue. So in this project, we, we started to actually translate the informed consent form into different languages. It might sound like an easy PC silly thing to do now, but for us, it was a big, big step. And we have uh, talked to a lot. We have presented this as a special topic on a, on a conference as well. Uh, and it seems that we, we have scratched upon something here that we need to learn more about. And people, sometimes they tend to be, feel a little bit, um, um, how do you say, stressed <laughs> about our stress on the informed consent in the multilingual school environment. So I think we have um, contributed to, to, to research here. And I, I won't talk much more about this now, but uh, because I also wanted to give you some examples of what we have actually done with the kids and the schools also. So I will give you two case studies, uh, open spaces, and it's in the bin, uh, as you have already gotten a teaser from Eamon. And they are all connected to the Agenda 2030 framework and the ATS STEM framework. And we have done other case studies and other topics as well, but I've, we've chosen two for this presentation. So the first case study that we conducted with, uh, with some of the schools is called Open Spaces. The topic was for the students, the challenge was for the student to redesign an open public space close to the school. And here you see a picture of a park just on the on the just behind the school. And as you can see, it's it's not it's not like a traditional park. It, and it wasn't it wasn't used as much for the kids either, even though it was very close to the school. So the schools were the kids were asked, so what would you like to have here instead? How can we redesign this public space so it's more 
um, available for for you so for you as a young kid or for other people in your community. And to support this project, we also had two master students who, who did their master thesis in, in, in this particular case study. And the kids, they were 11 and 12 years old. And um, first they, we had like a theoretical part where they learned mathematics and how to measure and how to calculate um, areas or circumferences and such. And also they learned about transportation, different kinds of material from a sustainable development perspective. And then they did like a second learning cycle. We had more a, a practical part where they built models. And also here you can see they tested their, they, they draw sketches of what they wanted to do. And then they went out in, in the park or the forest here and try to see does this sketch does the theory if their theoretical sketch match the environment and then they discovered they had to redesign it and apply other um, things so that they could fit fit the environment so to speak and during this learning activities they made um, digital portfolios uh, including sketches and, and technical drawings and stuff. So they had to learn how to do that as well. And we used the digital cool tool com called RM Compare. They also use Google Classrooms and YouTube, Bingo, Widget, and a couple of more. And this is the case study, the research design. Uh, we used the ATS STEM framework research design as well. And the arrow describes the, the process for the students for the project. And they, the students worked in groups of three or four. And then, so they had the idea. And then they, they, had, they first pitched their ideas in this portfolio. And then they conducted peer assessment, peer feedback through ACJ. It's called Adaptive Compact. Comparative judgment. I'm not sure how familiar you are with adaptive comparative judgment, but and we could talk about more that on that later. And then the feedback comments were um, fed back, and they they finalized the project. And then we had ACJ sessions uh, in the end as well. ACJ was not part of the ATS STEM frame, framework, but we added this on. But we also made online observations. We made interviews with students and teachers and the mentors. And the interviews were primarily conducted by my partner, Dr. Lena, Helena Lenholm. And just to give you uh, the adaptivity, we have been through, uh, we are still are in a pandemic. And the schools in Sweden remained open and the activities were like, ongoing. But we, as researchers and outsiders, were not allowed to visit the schools. So we made online observations instead of on-site, which I am accustomed to. And at first, I was like a bit hesitant. How can we make online observations? We, we will miss a lot of things. And now afterwards, I am thankful for being, able, being forced to do online observation because I learned a lot. And we stretched the, stretched the methodology on how to conduct on uh, classroom observation. Because being able to sit, actually sit on top of the table in the middle of a group discussion with young kids, you hear a lot. At first they were like, they were waving to me and like, but then they just ignored me and start and continued their dialogues. And it was fascinating, absolutely fascinating to sit there and observe and listen to their conversations. And we also, uh, this is just the uh, we also had data collection through adaptive, adaptive comparative judgment. It is a methodology where, you, where the students did pairwise comparison in, in the iterative process, and they, con, they provided peer feedback to each other. And also they received feedback uh, because they were exposed to their, stu, their peers' work as well. And I, we also conducted observations while they were doing these pair, pairwise comparisons. And that was also fascinating. I can tell you, I can talk about this for a long, long time. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is just to make sure that uh, in feedback, you can provide feedback, but it all stems back to what the, the, the recipient gets what they used, if, uh, if they used the feedback or not. And from the data we had, we could see that 
some of the feedback comments were really good quality in terms of in a sort of from a theoretical point of view. But then we could also see that uh, some of the comments were just ignored by the students because we could compare the student work prior to the feedback pro, uh, feedback uh, thing. And also we could compare how they had used the feedback in their ongoing projects. So it, it was really, really fascinating. And we were inspired by the work of Strimmer and Bartholomew at Purdue University. Um, so that was a very speedy <laughs> uh, overview of case study one. Case study two, it's in the bin. It's, this is really, really fascinating. And we have, um, this is a, a true, true story and a true world problem or really um, concern about the students. Uh, these students are uh, 10 and 11 years old and they were like really, really upset. They were so, it was so messy at their nearby recycling station. And they, uh, they went to the, tell, told their teachers and like, hey, you know, you know if you ever met a 10-year-old who is concerned about something, then you know how, how much energy and enthusiastic they can, uh, they can be. And the students had, had identified this concern um, by, by themselves. And the teacher seized the moment. They seized the opportunity here and embedded this in this ATS STEM project. And they were thought hard about what do the st students know already about recycling and what do they need to know to get started to get um, and prepare for, for a better future. So the first learning cycle was also more a theoretical point of view, where they also worked a lot with the languages because the, the Swedish language and, and the concepts regarding recycling and Agenda 2030. Uh, because and here they supported the Swedish language and also the, their knowledge development concerning this. And they did, um, they played like memory cards and they also did recycling on paper. <laughs> you can see how they moved around these different kinds of containers. They sorted, they, they did different sorting activities in terms of material, in terms of oh, all sorts of things. They also talked a lot about uh, why it is important to recycle. And the, the, this is a hard word to pronounce, degenerate. Um, how long does it take for something to disappear when it's in the, well, or this, does it disappear? But how long does it take to, for something to disappear if you just throw it in the, in the nature? And the students were very enthusiastic and very eager. And, this, and, and so it, it was fascinating. And then the, the practical part, and here comes the, um, if someone asked me, so what surprised you the most? Well, this is one of the things that surprised me is that the students, they, they um, observed a recycling station every day for, for a week. And I thought, well, how, how interesting is it to observe a recycling station? <laughs> well, it is a lot. It's very interesting. And students were so eager and they, they did all sorts of inquiry and and this project also echoed uh, to the the surrounding community and the teachers were interviewed by the Swedish uh, the Stockholm radio uh, channel and the nearby the nearby housing um, real estate uh, agency or a real estate company uh, they were intrigued so they they were talking about starting a, some sort of partnership with the school and, and, their, and their families. So it, it's, it's fascinating when you seize the opportunity to capture the students' interest um, and do something about it. So TC, Team Sweden's result and sort of discussion, well, the COVID pandemic has been, it's been a challenge uh, in, many, in many ways. And the schools remained open, so the teachers were very, uh, very hardworking. And, but at the same time, so we were a bit hesitant if we could go on and uh, this, uh, continue this project. But the teachers, they said this, is, this ATS STEM project has been a relief because when we had our meetings and our workshops, it was a relief for them because then they could just uh, keep the bad things 
out. They could just concentrate on teaching and learning and in the, in the wonderful STEM subjects. And so we had a great enthusiasm. We know that for sure. What we don't know as much is how what they actually learned, the students, because digital or not, it's really hard to bridge teaching and learning. And also we had the benefits of the large amount of data, uh, like the quality of feedback. And we will, we will continue to analyze that even further because uh, as I said, some of the feedback comments sounded really good, but it wasn't used and we would like to know more why. And also the student voice, this was also a surprise because in terms of one of the things that the students were supposed to develop during this project was to be able to work in groups and collaborate and such. And so we asked the students about group work and they said, oh, I love group work, but we don't do that much, said, said the students. But the teacher said, well, we do a lot of group work. And when we, when we made a classroom observation, we could see there was a lot of group work, <laughs> but obviously the students wanted more. And um, also we emphasized the importance of making sure that the applied digital tools, I mean, there's a big focus on digitalization here in Sweden, and I guess all across the world, but are the tools applied fit for purpose? We need to have a critical um, point of view here. I know it should, for, it should benefit the student learning, but not add too much on the teacher's workload. It's like a cost benefits. And we need to adapt to, to context. We all, always, when we work with schools, we need to adapt to their local context. And especially in a European project as large as this one, but also to the individual school, the individual class, and what's hap it happened. There's a lot of things happening in schools. And the informed consent that I just mentioned in briefly in the beginning, it has we have like a spin-off from this uh, ATS Learn project is that at least one of the schools has started to translate some of their uh, school documents to different languages that are spoken in their schools. We have also witnesses of teachers who was a bit reluctant but had to teach uh, the STEM sub subjects. Uh, in Sweden, there's a there's a lack of STEM teachers, but so some teachers are not trained. To to teach them, but they had to teach it anyway. And we have at least one teacher in this project who, thanks to the project, and a special thanks to the mentor, uh, she now says that she she would like she would like will she would like to continue to teach them. So that's a that's a really good thing, I think. And our next step is to spread the news uh, about this in, in our municipality to other schools. And also, we have an upcoming reform or. Uh, revised national curriculum. So we are uh, currently working on uh, in our municipality to introduce and uh, introduce the new um, national curriculums, and then we will embed these activities so that we could uh, help teachers to gain insights and also embed digital tools more and uh, the sustainable development goals. So this was a very speedy overview of what we have done in Team Sweden. And now I look forward to continue this uh, with you. So please contact me or Helena or anyone else. So thank you. That was sure. Thanks, Eva. That, thank was, <laughs> that was quick, but that was really, really uh, very helpful and actually all encompassing summary of the events speed run but a really good run i would say but uh yeah it's it's great to see hands-on projects with the students okay now for our final speaker of this evening is alberto sacido um, alberto has a master's degree in hispanic studies from Brown University, and he is a University of Santiago graduate in English. Uh, he currently works as a Spanish teacher in Rosalia de Castro High School in Santiago de Compostela, Spain. Uh, he has led teams of teachers in various Erasmus Plus projects, and uh, when he's not busy leading teams, he also likes playing guitar, singing, and he has an interest in documentary making and has a project underway. So he might tell you about it after the session, but yeah. 
go on. Okay, thank you, Lily. I'm going to share my screen. And oops, I always forget that I need the sound. So I'll go back into that. Yes. So I'm all set. Okay, well, uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, and well, I'm going to try to be speedy as well. Uh, telling you about our projects. Uh, our project is, is uh, uh, set in, a, in my town, Santiago de Compostela, which is right there in the northwest corner of the peninsula in Galicia, and in the town of Santiago, as you can see there by the many paths uh, from all over Europe. Uh, uh, it's a one of the sacred places in Christianity and a pilgrimage route uh, at the end uh, of uh, well, this pilgrimage route is my town and my school is right there in the old city, as you can see, in a building from 1602, which was uh, a university a college before and that has been many many things uh, through the years but in the 1940s it became a high school and uh, well right now Santiago de Compostela is uh, not a big city it's under 100,000 people it's the capital of Galicia this region on the northwest of the peninsula and uh, well my school here Rosalia de Castro uh, has uh, 1,100 students and 135 teachers, so it's a pretty large school considering our uh, schools in Galicia. Uh, well, what uh, we did in uh, this, uh, in Galicia particularly, is that 18 schools participated in ATS STEM, and uh, we uh, we did it with a group of 15 students, and then this was in the middle of uh, last year's COVID uh, problem. And uh, well, somehow it helped having less students in, in the classroom than what we normally have, which is more around 30 students. Uh, we were five teachers uh, participating in, AP, in our project in ATS STEM, in math, biology, history, me in Spanish and a support teacher uh, who helped those who had trouble uh, and just following and uh, had some uh, learning problems or disabilities. Well, we organized our staff uh, around uh, those uh, topics in the in the UN uh, 2030 uh, framework. And so after uh, dealing with some of the uh, of the topics that they would be interested in, uh, they ended up using COVID-19 since we were, of course, surrounded by that at all times, including in the classroom with the mask and everything. So we did two learning cycles. One, uh, it was focused on investigating COVID-19. And in the second one, we uh, decided to um, talk to the protagonists of this the pandemic, uh, both people who investigated and people who were in charge of the impact that COVID had in our daily lives. Uh, and while well, we interviewed them for a digital newspaper, that was the final product that I will be showing you uh, all along. And we used, of course, many of the digital tools uh, but uh, the principal one, the main ones were G Suite for Education, Canva, and Filmora, among many others. And this helped, of course, uh, with the collaboration uh, among the students and also among the five teachers that participated in this. You can see there in the picture in the first uh, learning cycle. Uh, it was titled Experiment with COVID, what they did in the STEM uh, subjects in math, in biology, but also in history. They were organized in five groups of uh, three students, and they did, which of these groups did uh, one investigation project. Uh, the one that you see there is researching mask protection, and they had to, to research first, and then figure out the way to show and to investigate how good these masks were, how much protection they had. And 
some of the topics that uh, were in those investigation projects and five were uh, masks, uh, CO2, and pandemic habits and math, and they did some polls among all the students in the school, and they ended up uh, with some very uh, interesting uh, in data about this. And uh, also historical plagues, they uh, research in history. Final products were five videos presenting the results of the research in biology, five presentations, or regular uh, presentations, Google presentations, sorry about this, um, uh, on different historical epidemics for the history class, and five Canva posters with the results of those polls that I talked to you about before, about COVID-19. And here are some of the of the products. Uh, here you can see. Para realizar estos experimentos necesitaremos fichas de dominó, cartulinas, papel cuasilantilla, rotuladores de cores, cinta de doble cara. Eh, esta ficha representa una persona contagiada. Como ves, hasta. That's what happened to the rest of the students. Uh, this is one of those products, the, uh, one of the slides from the presentation about uh, uh, one of the San Francisco Podia at the beginning of the uh, 19th century. And uh, this one is one of those graphics that I talked to you about at Canva, uh, done with Canva, uh, about pandemic habits that they did for the math. Um, in the second learning cycle, which was longer than the first one, we used some of the stuff that, uh, and of course, all the knowledge that they had investigating COVID uh, in the first place and, and getting to, to be people who knew a little bit more than, of course, the, the, the guys next door uh, about COVID. And from that, it was like a springboard to talk to um, the protagonists of this uh, pandemic both in research and also on the impact that it has in society, in hospitals, in schools, etc. And here we organized four groups of three or four students. One was of four students. And uh, we worked on two basic research projects. The so first one was uh, investig uh, investigating COVID, and the other one was the impact that COVID had on in society in general. Uh, then uh, they worked on two sections of this of this newspaper that you can see over here. Uh, this is the, the let's say the front page of this newspaper, and the sections are up here. Um, uh, the other uh, two groups of uh, 11, 12 year old uh, students uh, also collaborated in other sections in society, culture, and Galicia and the environment. Uh, but these two sections uh, focus for this group of 15 students on uh, COVID had uh, a bunch of final products. The first one was the digital newspaper uh, with uh, those interviews. There were 15 interviews, uh, eight and seven in eight to one section, seven in the other section, and uh, one YouTube channel because we also recorded, uh, video recorded every uh, interview and they learn how to uh, do the recording. Of course, first was investigating, then creating a questionnaire, then and doing the interview, and finally transcribing and editing the video. Um, reports which were done um, uh, by the information and the testimony that they had, uh, what uh, these people told them, they had uh, different um, headlines, let's say, and they did these reports on uh, both investigating COVID and the impact it had in society. Uh, 15 opinion pieces, the two were published, one in each section, and 15 video interviews, two video reports, and one video blog. One of the students uh, took his uh, opinion piece and did a video blog on it. Um, you can see them here in the picture. Uh, um, 
interviewing online, and that was in the middle of COVID as well, and from Madrid, the head of the health department for the whole of Spain. And he was, at the time, a very well-known figure who was on TV all the time. This was a special thing to have him in the classroom and answering their own questions. This developed every, this, this particular piece, the, our activity developed basically every uh, skill that we had to develop by collaboration, as you can see there, uh, problem solving, uh, communication, of course, self-regulation, and discipline, uh, knowledge, in this case in biology, but also in the impact it had in society, and uh, metacognitive skills, and uh, they were, um, and let's say, learning and, and thinking about what they were doing, and uh, uh, a critical thinking in the middle of this, and I, I will show you later uh, a piece where on the student who was doing the interview had to improvise a question, and it actually worked out pretty well, and finally creativity through the whole process. Um, one of the, I think, key um, things about he, uh, um, results of this uh, project working this way was assessment. They uh, did a lot of assessment along the way. They did a lot of uh, peer evaluation and co-evaluation, uh, and they assessed each other with, and worked and everything, every, every uh, task that they had to do was uh, evaluated or assessed uh, this way. Self-assessment uh, through personal self-evaluation diary. They had to keep a diary in a Google document, uh, but they also did some public ones uh, uh, in the classroom, but also at home, they did some self-assessment video like the one that I'm gonna show to you right now. And also a Google form rubric on skill self-assessment in each uh, step of the way. And then, of course, the typical evaluation from the teachers that we did with their evaluation with rubrics, the same rubrics that we used, and assessing the process through checklists, notes, and constant feedback on, on drafts uh, all along the way. Uh, here you can see one of the students um, self-assessing about, about those skills. And she did it okay, talking about communication, with me, uh, communication but uh, also uh, about uh, self-organization. This project had a lot of visibility in the media. Uh, we did a lot of project dissemination. Um, of course, first through the digital newspaper, and uh, the project was also shared with other two classes. Then uh, through the YouTube channel, which these two sections have uh, 18 videos, but uh, well, I'll show you the, the YouTube channel as well. And, but also uh, through uh, a, um, uh, a program, uh, one newspaper has a program to develop working with the press in the classroom. And uh, they were in a contest called uh, Journalism in the Schools. And they won that contest with their uh, two reports. Uh, they also did a piece on the original TV and Televisión de Galicia. And on the main newspaper, Love of the Galicia, there was a piece of news uh, uh, and also the report was published and they interviewed me as the teacher uh, talking about the project. Finally, in the local newspaper, El Correo Gallego, also uh, a piece of news. I'm going to just show you uh, just a little estudo, bit of alumnado de primero da ESO do Instituto Rosalía de Castro de Santiago. Es un proyecto educativo que forma parte do programa europeo Erasmus e que ten como objetivo fomentar a aprendizaje a través da participación directa dos alumnos. Investigaron sobre a pandemia, entrevistaron expertos, entre eles Fernando Simón, e elaboraron dúas reportaxes sobre a pandemia. Damos la bienvenida al doctor Fernando Simón, médico epidemiólogo. ¿Puedes describirnos cómo fue el día en que decidieron confinarnos indefinidamente y qué razones les llevaron a hacerlo? Una cosa que fue muy importante es que las comunidades autónomas que tenían capacidad para tomar decisiones empezaron a tomar decisiones que afectaban a la pandemia de COVID. 
This will be the end. <laughs> Third time, the same piece from the TV. Um, well, I'm leaving here links. Uh, you can contact both me. You can, uh, there's a link there for the school, but also to the newspaper, uh, digital newspaper, the YouTube channel, and the report that was published in paper on the newspaper. I can show you a little bit about this newspaper that you can uh, see online. This will be it. Uh, basically, you can see here the front page with post of all the videos and uh, the different uh, pieces that were done uh, by the three groups of kids. Here are the two sections. And for example, this is the report on this. Uh, as you can see, we used the graphs that we did in the first learning cycle and uh, the pictures, uh, but we also have a video report uh, about, of course, uh, the impact or about investigation. We uh, interviewed uh, many scientists and people who are researching COVID. And uh, finally, as I told you, before, let me see if I can get back to my. Um, back to my uh, presentation. This is uh, the website uh, for this program uh, from La Voz de Galicia. That uh, uh, the contest that we won with the whole report, uh, the two reports, both in Galician and in Spanish. Galician is our, uh, it's our own language and Spanish is the second official language here in the Northwest of Spain in Galicia. So uh, you can check out the, uh, the rest of the stuff, uh, everything is linked. Well, thank you very much for listening. And of course, I'm open to answering any questions, thank you. Thanks, Alberto. Um, so you've got some lovely, if you want to stop sharing screen for a sec, you've got some lovely comments yes, in the yes, chat yes. there. Um, okay, thank you. You've got some, if you want to take a look, some very positive comments. Um, thank you. The, the level of journalism by the students is, is phenomenal. Uh, um, what age, what age students? Well, they were uh, 11, most of them when we started, 11, 12. And uh, it's amazing the how much they learned about communicating with a complicated concepts like this. Uh, this last weekend, I had two of those students address um, an auditorium full of teachers explaining exactly this, what they did, and they probably did it better than I did. Uh, because, of course, they were very passionate about the topic and about the whole process. And since uh, interaction among them, uh, was, it, it was like a newspaper room. Let's say our daily work was uh, quite uh, interesting because uh, they were very excited about the whole process. And also researching, which is taking them from the textbooks to something that was, of course, much more active. And uh, another thing that they liked a lot was the constant feedback they had from each other and from the teachers. And so uh, the communication skills just went, uh, I know, up to, out the roof. And digital <laughs> skills. I mean, I was just yeah, even thinking of that yeah. feedback video uh, and the nice bit of editing, how the student had overlaid some images. I was like, that's a fine bit yes. of editing. Yes. Yes, well, they, they do that much better than we do. I mean, they, they yeah. just go online and get a YouTube tutorial. And then I I actually don't teach them. They teach themselves most of the time. I just, like, make things possible for them, let's say. But uh, but uh, they they do most of it themselves. Fantastic. Has anyone got questions for any of the speakers? If you want to pop it in the chat. Thank you, Alberto. It was really interesting. I'm impressed at all the press as well. I have a question for Ava just to get things started as well. A burning question. Are the bins tidy now? You never you never finish the story. <laughs> I hope so. At least tidy air. 
I don't know. I'll, I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> report, report back. Yeah. Brilliant. But the kids are very, um, like, uh, little police. <laughs> They're tidying them every day on their way to school, are they? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, fantastic. Okay. Uh, Eamon, I've one for you now. Yep. What next for the project? It seems like a huge amount of work has been achieved by all the different partners. What's the next phase? You must be coming towards the end. We, yeah, we have, um, we're going to touch wood. If the pandemic lets us, we will go to, to Santiago in, um, in, in January. Hopefully we'll get to meet Alberto and some of the other teachers there. So the other wonderful projects, there's a really good one on Inuesta in STEM, justice in STEM and injustice and, and the, the World War II is a great history one on it. They did a thing, I teach did one on the war and the, the STEM, how STEM impacted uh, the chemicals and the materials you need to create weapons and all this kind of stuff. It was fascinating. So World War II. Um, but we hope to go there and we have another, one of the one of the things we have coming up now and some colleagues of ours uh, from Slovenia are on the call. I think Petrus is, is, is on the webinar. We're, we're meeting with some policymakers uh, shortly and we're we're trying to see can we influence policy and and find some of the lessons from this from this project and and put it into practice and and share the good stories and the good the bad and the ugly i guess and that's what's been uh very nice today to be having this conversation and sharing with the eden network because as ava says there's all these different there's so many different networks around europe <laughs> uh there's um so it's amazing to try and link up with others now we've done a lot of work in the project so it's up to us to kind of engage with others and disseminate it more and we'll have a, a final conference in dublin then and we'll do a big evaluation of, of the project um so those are kind of things on our on our next steps i don't know if there's anything i, I missed there lily or anyone else who wants to no that's about it really i was going to share the save the date and the time for the policy webinar and maybe keep an eye on the twitter for the link and registration yeah, we'll have, and, I, we'll, and we'll there's going to be a fabulous end of co uh, project conference in dublin i believe i have it yes. in my calendar already yeah yeah it should be it should be great um but I suppose it's the other thing we're working on now as well. It's kind of fell off the radar. It was meant to be delivered a bit earlier is like, this is just a, these frameworks are very complex things. You know, you're trying to make sense of a load of different things, give it to teachers and students and see what they think about it. So we're looking at, we've done research evaluations on it that we can tweak and evolve the framework now and see, could we, how could we use, what could we do more of There's teachers in Ireland now who are, they've been trained up by the mentors and those teachers have now become mentors that, that took part in the pilot uh, because they've got such good skills. And it's lovely to see that kind of building out capacity in this thing and that the, the, the impact is a lot of these projects you're sort of thinking, well, what is the impact? Have we got like lots of citations or lots of people using the tools or whatever it is, but uh, it's real impact when you're increasing capabilities in people, you see, you know, teachers, Get an increase in capability, so that's been very heartening. I think and students. I think this. Yeah, I've enjoyed the student stories today. I'm really I'm seeing the work. That's excellent. Okay, any questions from the chat? You you mainly have admiration in the chat. I have to say today. No, not not too many questions. And Eamon, I think something you mentioned to me before was that you. You, you were seeking to uh, network with interested individuals in, in the area of, of STEM as well. Wasn't that, wasn't that something that, or have I got that wrong? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. We, we, if there's, um, I'm not sure these kind of, the next thing we have is like a lot of the dissemination and some of it's big events, open events like this one, this platform, which is amazing. Uh, and then there's others are more kind of, selective or invited we're looking to people but certainly we're if there's this particular people that we'd love to get in touch and, and keep these conversations going with them about the uh for at the conference and, and other other parts of it um 
And is there a particular project email or anything that, that they should, if you, Lily, if you want to throw something in the chat there, go ahead. Petra's yeah. just commented there and you can, you can email me as well about any, any aspect myself or Lily, about any aspect of project follows on Twitter, our website. We have a, a newsletter as well. Fantastic. Led by our, our amazing Slovenian partners. Absolutely. Um, and I guess I have a, a question maybe for Alberto. There was, there was something, Alberto, you, you talked a bit about with those entries to me yeah. about um, you said that the, the students, I think one of the things was interesting about the project or that's interesting is of feedback literacy, of, of getting, of really examining feedback and thinking about reflecting on feedback and, and assessment. And um, your students, a lot of some of the stuff we found in Ireland was a lot about competition how students love competition and peer peer support they love to learn in groups and they found that much more difficult in the pandemic when they're at home they didn't have that peer motivation and some of it is competitive mm -hmm. but i think you talked a bit about yeah. cooperation and, and turning competition into cooperation mm -hmm. what, what what does that look like to yeah. you well uh, that's not a path without some big stones in the middle i mean uh, they are used to like competing this uh, regular let's say normal um, sort of learning the competing for grades and everything and getting a uh, test um, to be the best and if you're not the best of course you're not going to get in the, the next school or the next well and we had some problems in the beginning i mean we were not used to it and uh, they had some some groups, like two groups, had some trouble among the the, the elements in the group. Uh, uh, no, not caring or not being nice to each other, wanting to do it just on my own. But then once we got uh, about that rocky beginning, let's say, uh, in the end, it was so much easier, and we were like working uh, at the same time. And just imagine. Uh, one of those boats and people rowing in different directions at the beginning. And then all of a sudden, for, for some reasons, like, hey, stop doing that. And then you clap <laughs> and everybody was rowing in the same direction. And because they were convinced that, uh, uh, well, that was a common goal and it, and it was for the best of the group. And mm. it, what's best for the group is the best for me also. So uh some sort of like selfish way but uh, it works out because uh, in the end they were helping each other and this worked uh very well with students who did poorly before because they have their peers helping them instead of the teachers helping them so that worked uh, pretty well uh doing that sort of uh, group work and they were helping each other so that was actually very very nice and those those I, students, yes, did did much better than than expected. Let's say a, a person who couldn't use a computer ended up editing a video like a pro. So that uh, and and this was a person who had like a learning disabilities. So that was very nice. Absolutely, it's a very it's and often the project even the project itself was. A lot of it is focused on skills, and we often think about skills and competencies on in, of the individual and the individual child or the individual person. Um, and often our measurements are all focused very much on individuals as well, even our, our, our research instruments yeah. as to how we measure learning. Are, they're concentrated on individuals. And it's hard to do group work and all that and change mindsets about tests and, and individualized mm -hmm. assessment, but also the impact that a that, uh, that, uh, that a project that is, can have is, is is hard to measure and capture. I think when, when students are, you know, getting captured in, in the media, in, in your, in some of your work and some of the work of Avis teachers as well, where, where there, people are picking this up, that has a real effect of change on the environment. It's not just the students' skills that are developing, they're affecting real change in their communities or, or in, in the world, which is, which is huge. It's beyond assessment, it's post assessment. Yes, 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 of course. Not everything has to do to be assessment, but assessment was again very important. The process was very productive, let's say, the, the whole process. So uh seeing each other's pieces and and reflecting on them also helped them very much. Because most of the time people are doing their own 
uh, paper or whatever they're working on, and th that's all they see. But if they have to put this all together, it's like rowing in the same direction. Uh, it, uh, each piece, like a puzzle, helps the other piece and cannot be done the whole, let's say, picture without all the pieces, and every piece is important. So that was very important also uh, to get them to feel that their piece was as important as any as every other person's piece. So that made that distance between those who do well and those who do not, uh, like it shortened it, it flattened it completely. Mm -hmm. Oh, and we are very excited about you coming to Santiago, so we can talk more about Please all God. of this. Please, Please, God. Right. Yes. Please, God. <laughs> yeah, no, hopefully. If there is a God to we'll we'll make it happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. So what we have, like almost, we, all, we almost have like 90% of the population vaccinated. So, well, things can go really not well, but well, maybe, maybe they won't. We'll see. Moving on from the pandemic, <laughs> um, I think I'll, I'll, br I'll bring the session to a close uh, and let me thank okay. all the speakers, Alberto, Ava, Eamon, and my co-moderator, Lily, and the support from the Secretariat, Linda and Robert. Thank you, everyone, and those who attended. Delighted to see you today. Uh, and the recordings, etc., will be available on the Eden website shortly. So thank you and have a good evening. Okay. Thank you, thank everyone. You Happy Romania Day. <laughs>